As I mentioned a little bit earlier today in worship, we are in our last Sunday of our worship series called Friend Request. Um, It's been a good six weeks during worship. We, of course, have been learning uh, lessons on connecting and caring and what that means to us in today's world where we are so technologically networked. What does it mean to have authentic, true relationships in today's world? Um, Not only have we been talking about that during worship, but over the last six weeks, we've also had a lot of events going around Um, in our church, happening in our church, where you all have gotten the opportunity to actually connect and care about each other. So here's just a little sampling of some of the things that we've had go on over the last six weeks. We had a group from our student ministries head up to uh, Giants Ridge on a very cold weekend in January and ski together. We uh, have had a Mothers and Daughters book club happening that Carrie Urkel has been leading. We had a preschool play date one Saturday, knowing that our preschool families can get a little cabin fever at this time of the year. We opened up our fellowship hall and our big toys so that they could come and play together. And then, of course, a couple weeks ago, we had our community celebration when we launched our new name, The Grove, and our new logo um, filled up the fellowship hall and had overflowing people into the atrium and even in the plaza a little bit. It's been a good six weeks of connecting and caring with each other. Um, During worship, we have been taking on the book of Acts, and we've been talking about how in this book of Acts, they were creating a social network of people as the new church, the new Christian church emerged. Just a review on Acts, um, it starts out with the ascension of Jesus. After Jesus had died and then was resurrected, he appeared to his disciples and spent some time with those disciples until he realized, you know what, it's time for me to leave permanently, at least in bodily form. So before Jesus left, he promised his disciples that he was going to send them the Holy Spirit that would equip them and give them motivation for their next steps. So what there, um, that, that when the Holy Spirit came amongst the disciples, just as Jesus had promised, there was this incredible event of flame and wind that came and then the, the disciples felt ready to go. So what they did is the people of the way, that's what they were known as, created these small gatherings of people that got together outside of their time in the temple, got together in homes, spent time together. And when those gatherings grew large enough, they sent people out to start up new gatherings. We, of course, have the conversion of uh, Saul to Paul in the book of Acts, where Paul gets on fire to share this message of Jesus with the Gentile, the non-Jewish communities. And we see the spread of the story of Jesus out into the gentle, Gentile communities, which really then sets the stage for a new religion. Christianity. We see it happening in the book of Acts. So our scripture this morning is actually in the place in this timeline where we um, have the people of the way creating these small gatherings. And what we're going to read from Acts 4 is a description of what these gatherings were like, how they function, what they were like. These gatherings were the very earliest form of our Christian church. They were like the first iteration of our Christian church. I sometimes like to think of them as like the baby church, is what these gatherings were all about. So um, as I read this and you see it and and listen to it, you're going to think, wow, this is just perfect. Everything was so great back then. You might get a little nostalgic about it, and we'll talk about all of that. Um, but in, in this, we kind of get a glimpse of what the kingdom of God might look like in this description from Acts 4 <clears throat> of these early communities. So here's our scripture for today. The community of believers was one in heart and mind 
see perfection, one heart and mind. None of them would say this is mine about any of their possessions, but they held everything in common. The apostles continued to bear powerful witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and an abundance of grace was at work among them. There were no needy persons among them. Those who owned properties or houses would sell them and bring the proceeds from the sales and place them in the care and under the authority of the apostles. Then it was distributed to anyone in need. (laughs) What do you think? (laughs) So I don't know about you, but I read that and I get a little freaked out. (laughs) Like, wow, okay. And I think about how these baby churches, these first iteration of our Christian church, um, are so different from what we experience today in 2018, where we have an institutionalized church, kind of a growing up church, right? from the baby church to the grown-up church and how it is so different. I become aware uh, when I read this how this early church was so focused on connection and relationship and making sure that everybody's needs were taken care of. Now, certainly in our church, churches around the world, we care deeply about relationships. Hey, we're in a worship series called Friend Request. We care deeply about relationships. Um, But we also can acknowledge that we are stewards of a system, of an institution. Um, As a pastor, uh, Pastor Pastor Dan and myself take this responsibility of leadership seriously. We hold this system up and know that it's important. There is uh, communication publications to get out. There is a building to maintain. There is uh, a computer network that has to be working. There is a database that needs to be updated. And, um, of course, there is a budget that needs to be balanced. As uh, leadership, um, and there's many of you that are in leadership in this congregation, we are stewards of this, and we have to constantly balance relationship with this system and work as hard as we can to ensure that this system is in place to support the relationships. But one thing we need to remember when we read this scripture, instead of getting all nostalgic about it and just saying, oh, if we could just go back to that, right? We have to remember that this was written in a completely different context than what we are experiencing today in 2018. This was written in 50 AD in the ancient Near East, not the United States in 2018. Our Western society largely revolves around this thing that we call a nuclear family, right? A parent or parents caring for children. And that's ultimately where we see our responsibility. Our responsibility is to take care of our nuclear family. And we're organized as a society around that nuclear family. Well, back in 50 AD... Um, in the ancient Near East, there was this word, word called oikos, it's translated into household. And, and, and this society was organized around the oikos, which included your family. Your family was in that, probably your extended family, but it also included your coworkers and their families. It included your friends. And those people who you would have regular contact with all were included in the oikos. So just like nowadays, our responsibility is largely for our nuclear family. Back then, their responsibility was actually to their oikos. They had to take care of their oikos, making sure that everybody's needs was taken care of. So you can see how this church that we talked about in Acts 4 
kind of came out of this system of oikos, how it was birthed out of this. The foundation was already there because this is what they already valued. So they created these oikos-style churches. Well, is there anything to learn then from this description that we get in Acts 4 if it's so different? Well, there's some similarities, too. There's definitely some lessons that we can learn from it. Because just like this early church, this first iteration of church, this baby church, their mission was transmitting the message of Jesus Christ to others, telling that story to others. And guess what? Our mission, our job as the church is to share the story of Jesus Christ with others so that we can make new disciples of Jesus Christ for transformation of the world. That's what we're about. That was their mission. That's our mission. That's what we're about. And what these folks taught us about doing that work is it only can be done when the community is taken care of. If the community is needy, if the community is struggling, if your people that you're in this disciple-making work with are struggling and hurting, guess what? It's really hard to be gospel sharers to other people. So this description that we see in Acts 4, what it helps us realize is the deep responsibility that we have to each other, that we've connected ourselves to because we're doing this kingdom work of sharing the message with Jesus to the rest of the world. Throughout this series, we've been talking about social media quite a bit and kind of the impact of that on us, the good and the bad and the ugly of social media and uh, what that all means for us. And when I think about this, um, one of the things that occurs to me is the power that's in a single click the click of a mouse, and how powerful that act of clicking a mouse actually can be. When I am uh, perusing Facebook, kind of just, you know, at night, going through, doing the scrolling thing, paying attention to what my friends are putting out there, every once in a while I'll see a, a post of a significant life event. Maybe a friend is sharing that they've lost lost a loved one, maybe um, there's a sickness or a disease, maybe they're sharing they got engaged or that they've had a baby, like real life, human experience stuff. And when I see those big posts, I always have this moment, I don't know about you, but I always have this moment of like, oh, how should I respond to this? This person just let me into their life through this platform and now what do I do with this now that I know this? Do, let's say that they shared that a parent had died. Do I just hit the sad reaction with the click of a mouse, the power in that? Do I just hit sad? Do I private message them? Do I send them an email? Do I call them up? Do I invite them out for coffee? Do I bring them a hot dish? What do I do now that they've let me into their life in this way? Well, of course, it's going to be based on what kind of my, what kind of relationship I have with that person that's appropriate. But when I just hit that sad reaction, I'm always taken aback a little bit by how easy it is for me to say, yes, I see your pain. I see your struggle. I see your excitement or joy or whatever it is. But yet how shallow the click of a button is. Like, don't I have any more responsibility to somebody who's let me in to this important part of their world? Isn't there anything more than I can do? What's my responsibility more than just clicking a button? And this is where the Acts 4 community teaches us, you know what, you have far more responsibility than just a click of a button. I loved hearing about... uh, from Rick and and Jeannie and Steve about our caring ministries in this church. Um, Honestly, you guys, it is a joy to watch Nurse Jane work every single week. 
She is absolutely amazing with her, her troop of volunteers that do this important work of our church. Here's a list of many of our caring ministries within our congregation. These are the folks doing the deep care work, ensuring that the needs of our church community, our oikos, is taken care of. And they are gifted and they are graced to do this work. The Spirit has put those gifts in them. And they do great work. But it's important for us to remember that they are not doing that work so we don't have to. This caring ministry team does this work because they're models for us. They're out there showing us how it should be done. When the church is the church, we all are doing this work. We're caring for our church oikos. And that's going to look different based on the situation at hand and where people are in their lives. Caring for somebody who is elderly and homebound looks one way. Caring for a young couple who just had their first baby and are trying to figure out how to get sleep means another thing. Caring for parents who have a teenager who is struggling with mental health issues means something else. Caring for a family where one of the adults has lost their job, that looks away. Caring for a family who has been stricken by illness or disease or death, that looks another way. Because at some point, we all are going to have this opportunity to see a need in our community and reach out and help meet that need. And at some point, we probably are going to be on the receiving end of that where we need our church oikos to step up and come around us and care about us. As members of our church oikos, it is all of our responsibility to step up when we see the need. And as members of this church community, when we have a need, it's our responsibility to share it with our church Not expect them to read our minds and know what we need, but it's our responsibility to share it with our oikos so that our need can be met. That's what it means to be responsible in our care. There are a lot of things that we can call a church. We can call a church a church. We can call a church a congregation. We can call a church a spiritual community, a faith community, a church home a church family, and today we learned that we can call a church a church oikos. Community of people that have the common mission of sharing the good news of Jesus Christ with the world and a recognition that in order to do that, we need to care deeply for each other. Friends of the Grove Oikos, this is our oikos. There it is. There's our oikos. There we are. And here we are. This is who we are as a community. And I just want to say thank you for being part of my oikos. Amen.